This hearing on North Korea will come to order. On February the 12th, North Korea conducted its third test, its most powerful test to date, a nuclear weapon, a smaller weapon, because North Korea is working on miniaturizing its weapon in order to place it on the head of an ICBM. This followed December's launch of a three-stage intercontinental ballistic missile. So we've had test after test. We've had broken promise after broken promise. And successive administrations, both Republican and Democrat, have clung to an unrealistic hope that one day North Korea will suddenly negotiate away its nuclear program. It's a hope that in 1994 many of our senior members here shared when we passed the nuclear framework agreement 19 years ago with North Korea. But during that whole period of time that we attempted to engage, we found instead that North Korea was perfecting their weapon, was violating those negotiations. So the approach that we have taken has failed. And three nuclear tests later, I think we have to be realistic. We have to find a better alternative. A failed approach to North Korea doesn't result in just a more dangerous situation on the Korean Peninsula. It, in fact, has resulted in a more dangerous world. We know that North Korea helped build the carbon copy of their program in Syria on the banks of the Euphrates. We also know that Iran has directly benefited from North Korea's long-range missile technology. We suspect that they have benefited from the nuclear tests. Last month, Ranking Member Engel and I were in Northeast Asia, and it is clear from our discussions there that our North Korea policy must change. Today, we will look at the illicit activities that are underwriting North Korea's weapons programs. We're going to look at its illicit missile sales abroad, at its meth trafficking. This is the only country in the world that manufactures and then traffics in meth. We're going to look at their counterfeiting of U.S. $100 bills, and we're going to think about the reason why this country has been called the Soprano State. We'll hear from one witness who will testify that North Korea's illicit money-making machinery continues to turn. But it is this dependency by the regime on illicit activities that can, in fact, be exploited. This is the Achilles heel. And we did this once. In the fall of 2005, the Bush administration targeted the Macau-based Banco Delta Asia for its money laundering role while U.S. money was being counterfeited, they were laundering for North Korea. And this led other banks in the region to shun North Korean business, which finally isolated the regime and cut off its, its ability to get hard currency. However, after Kim Jong-il made promises on its nuclear program, the pressure was prematurely lifted. Today, the current administration has done little to target North Korea's illicit activities. Instead, the administration has de deferred to a policy over at the United Nations and has op opted for strategic patience. The purpose of today's hearing is to examine how best to pressure North Korea's ruling elite by systematically restricting their access to that hard currency on which they depend. We'll hear from one witness who has firsthand experience spearheading such an effort. We'll be introducing legislation based on some of the ideas we'll hear today. It is important to realize that we have more options other than to simply rely on Beijing to do more. Disrupting North Korea's illicit activities will place tremendous strain on that country's ruling elite who have done so much harm to the people of North Korea. We must go after Kim Jong-un's illicit activities like we went after organized crime in the United States. Identify the network, interdict shipments, and disrupt the flow of money. 
This would sever a key subsidy for North Korea's weapons of mass destruction program, for only when the North Korean leadership realizes that its criminal activities are untenable do prospects for peace and security in Northeast Asia improve. I will now turn to our ranking member, Elliot Engel of New York, for his opening comments. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I'd like to thank you for calling this timely hearing and for your leadership in addressing the North Korean threat. I would also like to say publicly that it was a privilege to travel to the region with you earlier this year to discuss North Korea with top leaders in Seoul, Tokyo, and Beijing. The recent nuclear test conducted by the North was a dangerous provocation that raised tensions in Northeast Asia. It reinforces the fact that Pyongyang poses a serious threat to the national security of the United States and our allies in the region. Following the test, the House overwhelmingly passed a strong bipartisan resolution authored by Chairman Royce and myself condemning the North's irresponsible action. Among other things, that resolution called for the United States government to use available legal authorities and resources to defend our country's interests against North, Korea, North Korean illicit activities, which is, of course, the topic of today's hearings. North Korea's nuclear tests, ballistic missile launches, and attacks against South Korea have been obvious to the entire world. What has drawn less attention, however, is the fact that North Korea engages in a wide array of illicit activities to support its military program and leadership. The North Korean regime's criminal conduct, including drug smuggling, weapons trafficking, the sale of nuclear and ballistic missile technology to rogue regimes in Iran and Syria, and the counterfeiting of U.S. currency, cigarettes, and pharmaceuticals, serves as a lifeline to keep itself in power. Proceeds from these criminal activities are distributed to members of the North Korean elite, including senior members of the military, and are used to finance the top leadership's lifestyle. They are also invested in North Korea's military programs. I am one of the few members of Congress that have been to North Korea, and I've been there twice. I have visited the capital of North Korea, Pyongyang, on both occasions, and I can tell you that the North Korean regime would do better to help its own people, give them the things that they need, rather than spend its time and money on nuclear weapons and missile technology in defiance of the international community. The North Korean regime practices what experts have called criminal sovereignty. In essence, Pyongyang uses state sovereignty to protect itself from outside influence and interference, while dedicating a part of its government to carrying out activities in violation of international law and the domestic laws of many other countries. For North Korea, these criminal activities are viewed as necessary to maintain the power of the regime with no regard for the fact that they are corrosive to international law and order. So the question is, what steps can we take to combat North Korea's illicit activities? And can our efforts to prevent these activities be used to pressure North Korea to abandon its nuclear weapons and ballistic missile programs. Now, I just heard on the news this morning that uh, the um, agreement has been made, ostensibly with China, to uh, punish uh, North Korea for its uh, missile uh, launching nuclear tests. I hope that China will not do what it's done in the past and agree to sanctions and then just erode those sanctions uh, so the sanctions really never took hold. I hope that China uh, will finally understand that the North Korean regime is a threat to stability in that region of the world and in many regions of the world because, as Chairman Royce pointed out, um, Korea, North Korea is a rogue state uh, helping uh, countries uh, like Syria uh, trying to uh, obtain nuclear weapons and collaborating uh, with Iran. Um, I want this committee to know that um, on this um, issue, there is uh, not a, a, a millimeter's worth of, of, of difference between the chairman and myself. Um, we both view the North Korean regime as a threat and one that needs to be contained. I want to, to tell you the first time we took the trip to North Korea, it was probably about um, nine, uh, eight or nine years ago, 
And uh, one of the first things we noticed in Pyongyang was the billboards that were all across the country. One of the billboards still sticks in my mind. It uh, showed a uh, North Korean soldier bayoneting an American soldier in the head uh, in his helmet. And we knew it was an American soldier because on his uniform it said USA. So the regime is endemically hostile to the United States and uh, warrants watching. And I look very forward to our, our witnesses' uh, testimony. Uh, this is really very, very important. And we have many pressing concerns all around the world, but we ought not to forget about the pressing concern with North Korea. We ought to stay focused on the region. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Engel. Uh, this morning, we're joined by a distinguished uh, panel of experts. Dr. David Asher is a, non, is a senior fellow at the Center for a New American Security. Previously, Dr. Asher served as a senior Asia, advi Asia advisor at the State Department. He was the coordinator for the North Korea Working Group that attacked Kim Jong-il's illicit activities and finances. Dr. Sung Yoon Lee is a professor at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Known for his ability to turn a phrase, he has written extens extensively on the Korean Peninsula, including a recent piece entitled, Don't Engage Kim Jong-un, Bankrupt Him, which appeared in Foreign Policy Magazine recently. Ambassador Joseph DeTrani is president of the Intelligence and National Security Alliance. He served as the special envoy for six-party talks with North Korea in 2003. From 2010 to 2012, he was the director of the National Counterproliferation Center. And without objection, the witnesses' full prepared statements will be made part of the record, but I'm going to ask each to summarize your testimony to five minutes, and we'll begin with Dr. Asher. Chairman Royce, uh, Ranking Member, member Engel, and other distinguished members of the committee, I want to thank you uh, sincerely for this opportunity to testify on a matter of truly grave concern, the uh, growing nuclear proliferation risk of the North Korean regime and the need for a fundamental new policy approach to comprehensively addresses that threat that North Korea poses uh, to Asia and the world. Um, in short, our diplomatic efforts, which uh, I was part of along with Ambassador Tetrani in the six party talks, have uh, objectively failed. Um, unfortunately, so have our efforts to counter the proliferation activities and nuclear procurement of the North Korean regime. Uh, I believe in the next 24 months, North Korea's global and regional threat will go from bad to worse. Not only, only do I fear North Korea will deploy nuclear warheads on its expanding and increasingly sophisticated missile force, including directly uh, against the United States uh, and our allies, I'm concerned that the, the chances of North Korea exporting nuclear weapons and nuclear capable missiles to Iran is alarmingly high, if indeed something has not already occurred. North Korea has one and quite possibly two weapons grade uranium production facilities. According to the Institute of Science and National Studies, North Korea could accumulate enough weapons grade uranium for 21 to 32 nuclear weapons by the end of 2016 with one centrifuge plant alone. With two, it could be 26 to 37 nuclear weapons. This is on top of the 10 to 12 weapons that are publicly estimated uh, to already be in North Korea's arsenal. North Korea does not need uh, 30 to uh, uh, 40 or 50 nuclear weapons. North Korea does need money. And my concern is the, that the regime needs money, in particular, as a young regent takes power to cement his, his position, solidify his control over the military, and pay for his expanding and highly expensive WMD and missile programs, which he's been putting on prominent display in the streets of Pyongyang and during these recent parades. The nation that has the money and the need for nuclear material, including enriched uranium and weapons, most obviously is the government of Iran. In mid-July 2002, Korean uh, President Kim Jong-nam led a high-level delegation to Damascus, Syria for a mysterious purpose that we were monitoring closely at the State Department. On July 18, 2002, an agreement on scientific and technological cooperation was signed between the government of Syria and the government of North Korea. In hindsight, this scientific agreement was the uh, keystone commencing the covert nuclear cooperation between North Korea, uh, its General Bureau of Atomic Energy, 
uh, and its counterpart, the SSRC, uh, inside the Syrian government, which is in charge of weapons of mass destruction. Ominously, President Kim Jong-nam recently led a similar delegation to Tehran. On September 1, 2012, Iran and North Korea announced the signing of a scientific cooperation agreement that appears almost identical to that signed between North Korea and Syria in 2002. The Iranian retinue attendant at the ceremony uh, welcoming the North Korean president included the Minister of Industry, Mine and Trade, the Defense Minister, and most ominously, the head of the Atomic Energy Organization of Iran, Faridun Abbasi Devani. They also had high-level uh, discussions on coordinating key strategic issues. We can only guess what those are. It is time to stop the complacency on countering, containing, and disrupting North Korea's proliferation machinery and the malevolent regime before serious and enduring damage occurs to global security. Working closely with our allies, especially those on the front lines in South Korea and Japan, we need to organize and commence a global program of comprehensive action targeting Pyongyang's proliferation apparatus, its facilitators, its partners, agents, proxies, its overseas presence. We need to interfere and sabotage decisively with their nuclear missile programs. We also need to revive an initiative identifying and targeting the Kim regime's financial lifelines, including its illicit sources of revenue and overseas financial nest egg bank accounts, especially in China. Chinese banks and trading companies who continue to illegally facilitate access for North Korea themselves should be targeted. Finally, the United States should commence a program to influence the internal workings of the North Korean regime to undermine the Kim dynasty and ultimately lay the groundwork for a change in the regime if it doesn't change course fundamentally. Bringing about change in North Korea will require a top-down determined effort across the whole of government and among a league of willing foreign partners similar to the initiative that I had the opportunity to run during the Bush administration. Organizing such an initiative is not a trivial effort and will require considerable energy and commitment, including oversight of your committee. I appreciate this opportunity to make this testimony before you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to Mr. Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Sixty years ago today, on March 5th, 1953, the Soviet leader, Stalin, died and the prospects for ending the Korean War improved dramatically. And we had a ceasefire agreement signed in July, July 27th, and the past 60 years has been a history in dramatic contrast. South Korea has risen to be one of the world's most successful cases on how to build a free and affluent country, while North Korea has become a model, an exemplary failed state marked by a brutal regime that has maintained power through hereditary succession, extreme internal repression, and also military extortion. My point here is that the Kim dynasty, the DPRK, is engaged in a systemic contest for pan-Korean legitimacy, which is the more legitimate representative government representing, representing the entire Korean nation. It's a contest that North Korea cannot win. Hence, North Korea associates financial crimes, earnings derived from such activities, nuclear blackmail and repression as the sine qua non, the necessary condition to its self-preservation. This odd approach to national policy practiced by the regime has created a country that is quite abnormal, I would call it grammatical impropriety notwithstanding, uniquely unique. Let me illustrate. North Korea is the only country in the world. It is the world's sole hereditary communist dynasty. It is the world's only case of an industrialized, urbanized, literate peacetime economy to suffer a famine. It is the world's most cultish, isolated country albeit one with the world's largest military in terms of manpower and defense spending proportional to its overall population and national income. The result is this abnormal state, one that is able to exercise disproportionate influence in regional politics commensurate with its territorial size, population size, economic power, exceedingly small economic, political, or soft power. And this North Korea achieves principally through a strategy of external provocations and internal repression. In short, 
the leadership in Pyongyang will not make concessions on its nuclear and missile programs unless it is confronted with a credible threat that calls into question the need for its continued existence. And the United States is singularly well equipped to deliver this kind of pressure to the regime. This is due to the strength and attractiveness of the US financial system and the Pyongyang regime's low threshold for withstanding financial pressure because it is so overly dependent on illicit activities to maintain its own regime. The United States Treasury Department should declare the entire North Korean government a primary money laundering concern. This would allow Treasury to require US banks to take precautionary special measures substantially restricting foreign individuals, banks, and entities from gaining access to the US financial system. Treasury could also apply these measures to third country business partners that finance Pyongyang's shadowy economy. And the US should also ask allied governments to apply corresponding measures to third country banks, businesses, nationals doing business with North Korea. Moreover, the US should expand the designation of prohibited activity to include those furthering North Korea's proliferation, illicit activities, import of luxury goods, cash transactions in excess of $10,000, lethal military equipment transactions, and, and the perpetration of crimes against humanity. North Korea is the world's leading candidate for indictment for crimes against humanity. Such measures would effectively uh, debilitate, present the North Korean regime with a credible threat that would far surpass what took place against Banco Delta Asia in 2005. I would urge Congress to pass a bill that gives Treasury investigative powers and requires the Treasury Department to investigate reports of suspicious activity, enforce UN Security Council resolutions, and also clamp down on further perpetration of crimes against humanity. By linking human rights violations with financial sanctions, the United States could uh, deliver a potent uh, threat, a credible threat to the regime. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Lee. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Engel, thank you for the invitation, members of the committee. Uh, it's an honor being here with you. Uh, let me thank you, Ambassador. We appreciate thank your you, sir. willingness to testify. By, uh, by way of background, um, in January 2003, uh, North Korea pulled out of the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, and, and, and told the IEA and, and monitors to leave the country. And that was after the United States told North Korea that we knew they had a clandestine uranium enrichment program, which was in violation of the NPT and other commitments they made with the agreed framework. Uh, we started the six-party process in August of 2003. It was a two-pronged approach uh, by way of background. And in 2003, with the first plenary session, we told the North Koreans, we're looking at denuclearization, but we're also looking at your illicit activities. We're looking at you counterfeiting our $100 bill, counterfeiting pharmaceuticals, getting very, very much involved with the counterfeiting of cigarettes, human rights issues for which we need transparency and you need to make progress on. It was a dual approach. Uh, in September 19th, you cited that, sir, in September 19th, 2005, we had a joint statement. We had two things on the 19th of September 2005. We had a joint statement committing North Korea to denuclearization, comprehensive, verifiable denuclearization, in exchange for security assurances, economic assistance, and ultimately normalization. But with the normalization, before we'd even talk about that, they need to make progress on their illicit activities and human rights. And on the same day, the 19th of September, on the Federal Registry, Treasury moved forward mm -hmm. based, on, based on Section 311 of the Patriot Act, the predicate being money laundering. And that was what you cited, sir, Banco Delta Asia, where Banco Delta Asia, the Macau authorities, and the bank froze about $25 million of North Korean currency. The impact was immense. Because the message to international financial institutions were, was very clear. If you do business with North Korea and they're involved in money laundering, you could be affected also. 
the impact was immense. The North Koreans were upset with this for obvious reasons because, of, as, you, as you described, it caused significant pain. That was a model. Unfortunately, we went back, unfortunately in the sense that we, we, we went back to negotiations and we proceeded with negotiations. They eventually got the $25 million back when the uh, Banco Delta Asia was in compliance with our, our laws and, and, and we moved forward. But what happened was what you described, missile launches and nuclear tests in 2006 and 2009, 2012. So we're looking at four launches, three nuclear tests. During this period of time, we have three Security Council resolutions, UN Security Council resolutions looking at sanctioning them. They're moving their money. We have executive orders coming out of Treasury, Executive Order 13382, Executive Order 13551, which speaks to proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and their supporters where we would sanction those who are involved with WMD proliferation and anyone supporting them, a state, a bank, any entity. So we were looking at it, we were pursuing it, and commensurate with that, concurrent with that, we were looking at proliferation security initiative. That means the United States, with over 90 countries, would come together to say, if North Korea puts anything on the high seas, and we have any information indicating that they're proliferating something, they're moving something they shouldn't be moving, in violation to Security Council resolutions, we would interdict those shipments. We've had many hail and queries. A number of these vessels were returned around at sea. A few of them were going to Myanmar, and they went back to port in North Korea because of the determination to do something with that. Now, North Korea persists. North Korea persists with their human rights issues and they persist with illicit activities, but they know very, very clearly if they want any progress, with any progress with the United States, certainly with the United States, illicit activities have to go by the wayside. This is causing pain. And I could only, uh, I only, I concur fully with my colleagues here and with your statement, Mr. Chairman. The sanctions are biting. They are biting. It's, a, it's causing North Korea not to get access to the funds they need, not to move the money they need. They need to bite even more significantly and they should have even more impact as we move forward with further, if you will, uh, responses to the most recent nuclear test. And there will be additional sanctions and additional activities. So the message is clear to North Korea. They have two paths. There will be further sanction. They will become more of a pariah state and they will find it even much more difficult to survive if they continue on the present path or they can come back to the September 2005 joint statement and look to becoming a more legitimate nation state and getting, and getting into the financial institutions and getting their economy back in shape and caring about the people. And a sign of going on on that one, the basic to all of that is comprehensive verifiable denuclearization and the ceasing of all illicit activities and transparency and progress on the human rights issues. Ambassador Detrani, thank you very much for your testimony. I I wanted to go back to an observation that Professor Lee made. He noted that if sanctions are effectively imposed and hard currency is cut off, the rise in the number of disgruntled men in the party bureaucracy and the military would more than any conceivable variation on artful nuclear diplomacy give the Kim regime reasons to rethink its long-term strategy. And in the same vein, uh, Looking back on your efforts, Dr. Asher, in the, in the last administration, you say that the effect of the campaign froze North Korea out of key aspects of the international financial system, and that that produced a destabilizing internal effect that could have been magnified to compel North Korea to abandon its nuclear program. Pretty definitive statement. I wondered if, uh, if you if our panel might elaborate a little bit on the impact on the regime's financial lifelines and its effect on the regime's mindset with an eye toward whether this could be redone again if, if we went with legislation to try specifically uh, to replicate what was done with Banco Delta Asia. Um, I'm working on legislation and I, I wondered how could Congress help in this vein? And we'll begin with Professor Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The notion that sanctions are not necessarily effective because they do not necessarily lead to regime change or a fundamental change in the behavior of autocratic states, I would say is not particularly relevant to North Korea. 
I would argue that North Korea is uniquely vulnerable to targeted financial sanctions because, because unlike any other authoritarian governments in the world, the regime is so dependent on such revenue streams, illicit streams of revenue. So blocking, damming, if not all, even some of those streams of revenue would achieve secondary, tertiary effects in any sanctions regime, which is to provide that regime, that target, with a psychological threat of prolonged sanctions that would lead to a rise, increase in the number of disgruntled men in the North Korean party, bureaucracy, military. This is an existential crisis for the regime. How much does the regime depend on such illicit earnings? Well, we don't know for sure, but I know that Dr. Asher and others have estimated that as much as perhaps one third or even as high as 40% of the regime's total trade and probably a much higher sum in terms of the regime's cash earnings are derived from such criminal activities. So North Korea is singularly uh, vulnerable to such targeted sanctions, I would say. I'll ask uh, you, Dr. Asher, to uh, chime in on that. I, I remember I was in North Korea in 2007 and uh, afterwards had an opportunity to talk to a defector who had worked in their missile program. And he told me how obtaining hard currency was so difficult that the whole production line at one point was shut down I think he said for seven or eight months because they couldn't get the hard currency to buy on the black market gyroscopes that they needed for the, for the program. But, but let me ask you your thoughts. Well, I mean, I think the key to the effectiveness of our program of action during the Bush administration uh, first term was we created a very sophisticated model working with Ambassador Detrani in his previous capacity and other members of the intelligence community as well as doing a lot of open source research on businesses. Businesses have public records associated with them. Uh, we understood that North Korea's financial lifelines were centered outside of North Korea. North Korea did not have its own internal banking system. It was largely resident in places in Southeast Asia and Austria and Hong Kong and Macau, places uh, that we could get to. Uh, and given the fact that there was a dispro disproportionate association between the high-level regime finances of Kim Jong-il and his family and illicit activities, we knew that by combining law enforcement uh, as, as well as targeted regulatory actions involving the Patriot Act, uh, we could affect those finances. And we did so in a way that was aiming speci at specific individuals, specific actors, specific institutions. We didn't just go willy-nilly at this. There's a sort of black art behind the, the, the way that this was conducted, and I think that's why we had an effect. I believe the same could be done today, but it's going to require a use of coercive force against Chinese institutions and actors and trading companies that uh, will require uh, considerable uh, resolve uh, by the administration. Ambassador, your thoughts, and then we'll close. No, I agree with uh, Dr. Ash and Dr. Lee. Uh, I think they are biting. Uh, the, uh, I mentioned the executive order, uh, Treasury's executive order 13382, uh, proliferation of WMD and their supporters. I mean, entities like the Tanchon Bank, uh, COMID, the Korea Mining uh, Trading Corporation, the, these entities are, are being sanctioned, but anyone dealing with them would come under the same, the same ruling and, and, and have the same consequences for dealing with them. So, so yes, and, and I, in addition to the sanctions, which are abiding and are very, very important, I believe the proliferation security initiative, by getting the countries, getting all our countries together to ensure that North Korea does not proliferate and does not receive the materials that are necessary to sustain their programs is so, is so vital. And I think we, we're moving I think pretty aggressively and, and with the significant success in that area. And, and as Dr. Lee said, I think it is biting because eventually it's going to have consequences. You've been there, Mr. Chairman. There's two North Koreas, the provinces where the leadership in Pyongyang really doesn't care that much, and Pyongyang itself. Well, eventually these sanctions are biting those elites, those in Pyongyang who rely on this flow. And that's going to cause some significant pressure on the leadership. And that, and that, I think, is powerful. Thank you. Mr. Engel. When uh, Chairman Royce and I were uh, in Asia 
few weeks ago, uh, we raised with the Chinese leadership uh, the situation in North Korea. Wondering if any of you have thoughts about China and the role it has been playing and the role that it might play in the future. I mentioned before that this morning I heard that there was an agreement which China ostensibly was going along with, but we, we know that uh, China has been uh, propping up the regime for years. China is uh, fearful that in case the regime were to collapse, they'd have a million uh, North Korean refugees moving into China itself, and that China also would have a fear of, um, of South Korea dominating a united Korea and having a U.S. ally right up to its borders. I'm wondering if any of you can give me your thoughts on, on China's actions and what we can expect. Um, Mr. Engel, I, I think China, and, and you mentioned that, I think China is a, is a key player, if not key to the North Korean nuclear issue, certainly very, very uh, instrumental in, in getting some resolution. I think China has been working it. It's been, it, they, mo they modulate their uh, approach because of what you cited, the, ref the potential for instability, refugees coming across the border, and the concern about the weapons. But I think, uh, I think our objectives are similar, denuclearization. It's not in China's interest to see a nuclear North Korea for well, the same reasons. If there's instability, there are weapons there. And that stuff can get in the wrong hands. One of the big issues we have and concerns we have is nuclear terrorism. The ability of some of this material, it was cited a minute ago by the chairman in his statement, Al-Kabar, and you mentioned that also, sir, Al-Kabar, what they did in Syria. I mean, having this nuclear material in North Korea, it's not only North Korea having nuclear material and weapons, it's the, the potential for that proliferating, and China is very concerned about that. So I think with China, and now with the new government coming in, Xi Jinping, and, and now with the new Security Council resolution and additional sanctions, I think we'll, uh, we, we I, I believe, and hopefully we will turn a page, and we will be more in concert with them and approach this issue uh, in, a, in a very deliberate way to include a dialogue with Pyongyang so they understand what the consequences are. There's no surprises here, so they know what's ahead for them, and they have a decision to make as to what path they want to take. Dr. Lee. Yeah. Over the years, it's become something of a shibboleth in the policy world as well as in the academic world that the Chinese Communist Party will never give up on the Korean Workers' Party, on the DPRK. 60 years ago, or in 1950, <coughs> China had compelling reasons to intervene take a great risk and confront the United States-led UN forces in the Korean War. Today, China has compelling reasons not to take that risk and to continue to develop its economy and grow richer by protecting the integrity of the international financial system. Uh, Mao Zedong was viewed 60 years ago as the leader of the Asian Revolutionary Movement. Uh, for China not to take action as the DPRK was falling would have had implications on his intention to liberate Taiwan, and China had a fallback plan in the Soviet Union. Today, the emergence, the eventual emergence of one free Korea, a single united Korea that is democratic, pro-US, and pro-China of necessity, it will be pro-China, poses no threat to the Chinese. Of course, the Chinese won't move to destabilize Pyongyang on their own initiative. So we, the United States, can give China that incentive. Thank you. Any uh, uh, thoughts about uh, the negotiations that, uh, that, that the North uh, would like to have ostensibly with the United States? One of the things that sticks in my mind when I met with North Korean officials again on, on two occasions was that they seem to be disinterested in the six-party talk and more interested in bilateral talks with the United States. Do you think that's still the case today? Dr. Lee or Ambassador, anyone? Anyway. I, I definitely think that is the case. It's always been the case. North Korea has made it very clear they, they want a dialogue with the United States and the U.S. position has been this is a, this is a regional, it's a, it's a multilateral issue. Uh, but there are issues like the illicit activities we were talking about that are very unique to the United States. In many ways, that's why the September 2005 joint statement has two pieces to it. Resolving the nuclear issue, but also each country having a bilateral dialogue with the North Koreans on issues that are unique to their respective countries. And that's, and that's been our approach with the North Koreans. And they have reluctantly 
given the fact they have no choice, they've accepted that reality, but they indeed would prefer just dealing with the United States. Well, thank you. I'm wondering if I could ask Dr. Asher a question, and um, I'll conclude with this. Um, in your written testimony, you talked extensively about the link between North Korea and Iran. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you could um, tell us a little bit, what's your assessment of the effectiveness in crippling the North Korean regime if sanctions uh, similar to what we are implementing against Iran are enacted against North Korea? Yeah, it is a very good question. It is quite startling to me that the sanctions that are imposed and the action programs that are imposed against North Korea pale in comparison with those being uh, pursued against Iran today. Uh, North Korea is a country that is not a theoretical enriched uranium producing bomb making nation. It is creating a large stockpile right now. It is a proven track record of exporting every single military program it has ever developed, including its nuclear weapons program, as was evidenced in Syria. The fact that the CSADA, comprehensive Iran sanctions, uh, eclipse those imposed against North Korea to me is a, a clear indication of why our policy is in some ways upside down. North Korea has the supply that Iran needs of basically untarnished, uh, unvarnished, uh, non-affected uh, nuclear material and capabilities. We should have proposed, we did propose, and we should have pursued an aggressive program of action against the North Korean nuclear network equivalent to which we pursued against the AQ Khan network out of Pakistan. It was something that the ambassador and I both believe fundamentally, and we tried to convince the Bush administration to agree to. We failed to do that. As a result, North Korea is in a position to be uh, relatively pristine in its ability to provide the supply that Iran and other nations may desire to fulfill their nuclear goals in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Engel. We now go to the Chairman of the Middle East Subcommittee, Eliana ross -Layton. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for convening this important hearing and, and most importantly, uh, for getting such a great panelist uh, before us today. Uh, our approach over the years in dealing with North Korea has uh, resulted in complete failure, administration after administration. North Korea has held America and the world hostage because Pyongyang continues to pursue its uh, goal of nuclear armament, thumbing its nose at the world while leaving its citizens uh, malnourished, suffering from disease, and indeed starving. North Korea uses the same dangerous tactic time and time again. It dangles the idea that it is willing to de denuclearize as a bargaining chip, and then the Kims renege on this. It was the Bush administration's inability to see that evil trick that led to the erroneous and dangerous decision to remove North Korea from the state sponsor of terrorism SST list, despite the fact that illicit activities continued. As we have seen in the last few months, North Korea has only further advanced its nuclear and ballistic weapons capabilities. I was vehemently against the Bush administration's decision to remove North Korea from the SST list and have continued to call on the current administration to place North Korea back on the list for the sake of our national security and the security of our allies in the region, including South Korea and Japan. The fact that North Korea warned today that it would cancel the Korean uh, ceasefire in retaliation for more sanctions only reaffirms the threat to our ally, South Korea. Kim Jong-un has made his priorities clear. North Korea is uh, perfecting uh, nuclear capabilities, supporting and equipping rogue regimes such as Iran and Syria. Such support to uh, other uh, state sponsors of terrorism, because I believe North Korea sh belongs on that list, should be more than enough for the United States to redesignate North Korea on that list. I have introduced a bipartisan bill, the North Korea Sanctions and Diplomatic Non-Recognition Act, that would do just that. How extensive do you think the cooperation between these rogue regimes has been? I would ask the witnesses. And if North Korea is allowed uh, to keep its nuclear and a ballistic missile program and successfully shares this uh, material and technology with Iran, the world is looking straight in the face of the most uh, dangerous nuclear arms race that we could ever imagine. We know that North Koreans need money, and one of the only ways that it can get that money is through the, these uh, illicit activities, counterfeiting, drug trafficking, proliferation of nuclear and ballistic missiles, technology, and expertise to other rogue regimes. 
If Iran is one of North Korea's main sources of hard currency, how effective have recent sanctions been in limiting Iran's access to cash, and what more needs to be done to ensure that it cannot continue to finance its uh, or North Korea's nuclear programs? Another main source of aid for Pyongyang is uh, the help from China and Russia. Now, we know the news that uh, China has reportedly agreed to support new sanctions at the UN on North Korea. However, there have been no final agreements on the language. Uh, do you think that China will agree to meaningful measures, or will the Chinese uh, water down the sanctions to protect North Korea? How can the U.S. convince China and Russia to stop protecting North Korea, both at the UN and domestically? We must begin to, to have a comprehensive approach to our sanctions capability when we attempt to cut off these regimes from their source of income. And that's why I introduced the Iran, North Korea, and Syria Nonproliferation Accountability Act, which will prohibit assistance to any foreign government that has provided assistance to Iran, North Korea, and, or Syria that would increase sanctions on any person or entity transferring goods, services, or technology for the chemical, biological, or advanced conventional weapons program of Iran, North Korea, and Syria. Now, according to reports, it may be possible that the Pyongyang's latest nuclear test was a test for Iran uh, and uh, North Korea. What are the possibilities that North Korea was testing an Iranian warhead? And would this be a game changer, and what implications would this mean for U.S. policy toward Iran and North Korea? But uh, I'm more interested in, in uh, Dr. Lee's recommendations for legislation that we could file or pressure we could bring to bear to Treasury, Commerce, and other uh, agencies uh, to enforce stronger sanctions. Do you believe that those can be done through an executive order? They should be done by Congress? Uh, do you believe that listing North Korea as a state sponsor of terrorism would then include all of the uh, sanctions legislation that you recommended or, or, or action that you recommended, Dr. Lee? One second. Never, we'll talk later. Uh, Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Lee, if you all of the above, but as Ambassador Trani mentioned, we have executive orders. Uh, 13382 signed by President Bush in 2005 and 13551 signed by President Obama in um, 2010. The question is enforcement, pol the political will to enforce those measures, to clamp down on proliferation activities, and to punish third party, uh, third country parties, institutions, Chinese banks, and so Thank forth. you very much. Political will. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Yes, we'll go now to Mr. Felomo Vega. He is the ranking member on the Asia and Pacific Subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, North Korea remains, as Winston Churchill once said, of the Soviet Union, a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. We have only the slightest glimpse of what its leaders are like or what they are thinking. This includes the new 28-year-old leader, President Kim Jong-un. That is why the opportunity presented itself when the basketball star named Dennis Rodman's recent visit should not be completely dismissed as trivial. By my, by my calculation, Dennis Rodman has now spent more face time with North Korea's new leader than any other American. As I recall, Mr. Chairman, we were dismissive of the invitation that the American ping pong or table tennis team received to visit China while playing in a tournament in Nagoya, Japan in April 1971. China with a legacy of the Korean War and ongoing great cultural revolution was much a pariah state then as North Korea is depicted today. However, it should be noted that this so-called ping pong diplomacy changed world history with the American president named Richard Nixon arriving in Beijing less than a year later. It is my understanding President Kim Jong-un loves basketball. Sometimes sports, Mr. Chairman, can have a positive result on diplomacy. As I noted in a recent article, the Korean newspaper, as only Nixon can go to China, it now seems, in my opinion, at the height of the renewed tensions of the Korean Peninsula, in my opinion, only South Korean President Park Chung-hee can also move to seek national reconciliation between the two Koreas. She took a first step towards that reconciliation process 
by going to North Korea in 2002 to meet with Kim Jong-il, the man widely suspected as being responsible for the death of her own mother. Why did President Park embark on that journey for peace? In my opinion, she did for the love of country and for the tens of thousands of families divided by a demilitarized zone mandated by more powerful nations almost 70 years ago. Yes, the South Korean people are concerned about the nuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, but once again, they will be the victims, not of their choice. A resulting second suicidal war, and a nuclear one at that, would see the Korean people once again pay the greatest price with untold human suffering and a lose-lose situation on both for both North and South Korea. In my opinion, the leaders of both North and South Korea need to step up to the challenge, step up to the plate to seek ways to resolve their differences and to do so in their own way and not be dictated by other countries. Previous American presidents have all called for a nuclear-free Korean Peninsula, but all the rhetoric has not stopped North Korea from the development of a nuclear weapons program, nor have all the sanctions. China, a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, shares an 800-mile-long border with North Korea. It remains Beijing's primary goal to preserve a friendly relationship with North Korea for obvious reasons, and at whatever the cost. Adding more sanctions, in my opinion, Mr. Chairman, may threaten Pyongyang's survival, but will not be seen as being in China's best interest. Therefore, China does not vigorously enforce sanctions, and in doing so, sanctions, in my opinion, are largely meaningless. Indeed, financial sanctions aimed at Chinese banking institutions, which do business with North Korea, seem rather presumptuous. Coming from a country like ours, which owes China a debt of some $1.3 trillion, according to the latest report on national debt to other countries. Mr. Chairman, can you imagine that a heated situation among countries in Asia setting off a nuclear arms race where these frontline states will develop and acquire their own nuclear weapons, nuclear arsenals in Japan, in South Korea, in Taiwan, in Indonesia, in Vietnam, in the Philippines, and Malaysia, it's not a scenario that conjures up a peaceful, prosperous Asia. The same can be said of countries in the Middle East. Iran fears Israel's capability, nuclear capability. They're bringing by fear among the Arab countries. I mean, the chain reaction continues. Where's nonproliferation in all this? If I will add one thing, Mr. Chairman, and let me make this one point clear. North Korea is already a nuclear state having its capability now of a stockpile of some eight nuclear weapons. And I suspect it now has the capacity to produce even more nuclear weapons. My time is up, Mr. Chairman, thank you. If, if I could just ask, were you, were you addressing the chairman when you, said, uh, when you said Iran fears, fears Israel and therefore is developing I would say that weapons capability. Yeah, my point, Mr. Chairman, I wanted to say that this is what makes a sense of hypocrisy and the double standard of the whole nonproliferation uh, uh, policy. Why is it that we continue to allow the five permanent members of the Security Council to hold on to their nuclear weapons, nuclear bombs, and then telling the rest of the world you cannot have them? And this is where, in my opinion, I may be wrong, right. why this, this, this sense of strain and tension among the haves and the have-nots. And, I, I, and that's, that's why. I, I understand, but to quote former President Kennedy, sometimes the difference is attitude. The difference between states that are using something for defense, but other states that have avowed an intent I, uh, to I, use it for offensive capability. And I, since you would address the question to me, I... And, and I might add, Mr. Fine. Chairman, we have a, uh, a saying in the islands, which means the coconut tree Leaves do not move for nothing. There's a reason, there's a causation. And I think this is perhaps one of the issues to the whole nonproliferation uh, uh, movement. And what we're trying to do is that what is the cause? What's, 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 what's causing countries like Iran and North Korea to cling on to their nuclear weapons system? Uh, and that, that was the basis of my, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna go now to Mr. Shabbat, uh, who, is the rank, who is the chairman of the subcommittee 
on Asia and the Pacific. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for calling this very timely hearing. Um, I look forward to working with you in an effort to create uh, stronger and more effective sanctions on the North Korean regime. I think most of us agree that more needs to be done aside from the issuance of strongly worded responses from the administration, the usual routine condemnation from the United Nations, and perhaps a slight tightening of sanctions from our Western allies. We know that the primary opposition to our efforts comes from North Korea's prime benefactor, Communist China, and that without substantial cooperation from Beijing, our efforts to curtail this illicit activity uh, of the Kim regime will be greatly hindered. Uh, this morning, it was reported that the U.S. and China reached a deal uh, in the United Nations on a new set of sanctions against North Korea. Uh, it's not clear what the new measures include beyond possibly adding new companies and individuals to the financial and travel ban li list. Um, Professor Lee, um, you discuss how the use of Executive Orders 13382 and 13551 uh, could actually freeze the assets of Chinese entities assisting North Korean proliferation activities, and that this pressure would induce Beijing, hopefully, to cooperate. Do you think this is an effective way to persuade China to work with the international community uh, to pressure Pyongyang, or do you think it would cause a more negative reaction uh, from China's new leadership? Um, China has already said it will not uh, embargo oil for fear that uh, if the North Korean economy collapsed, it could send uh, waves of refugees uh, to China. Uh, wh what is the most effective way for China to work with the international community and pressure the Kim regime while also protecting its borders? Thank you very much. The Chinese are supremely pragmatic. There is a reason, in my humble opinion, that the Chinese civilization is the oldest in the world on point of continuity, and it's due to their resilience, hard work, and profound pragmatism. If the Chinese were given financial disincentives, reasons to, to put it crudely, lose money, I think that would be more effective in gaining Chinese, China's attention than other channels of diplomatic action. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Asher, let me, uh, let me ask you, um, North, Co North Korea you know, earns a, a very large share of its income from illicit activities, as, as you had mentioned. How important is it uh, to the regime's survival uh, and its military uh, capabilities? And has the percentage of GDP originating from criminal activities uh, changed in recent years? Does it remain uh, similar levels? What, what would you suggest that the administration and Congress do in this area that would actually do some good? Well, I have no doubt that the interagency effort that we ran with over 15 government partners around the world and 14 U.S. different agencies, including uh, multiple Department of Justice agencies, to investigate and uh, uh, implicate and indict North Korean entities, including members of the leadership and leadership organs uh, uh, in uh, the conduct of a multi a wide range of illicit activities, everything from counterfeiting to cocaine trafficking to, um, you know, counterfeit cigarettes, uh, methamphetamine trafficking, including into the United States. Uh, you might be aware that we had a sting operation going on within the Gambino crime family through our agent Jack Garcia, the 320-pound undercover FBI agent who was also uh, in touch with North Korea, uh, which we learned in the process that was truly a soprano state, given their affinity for uh, the uh, partnership they formed with that crime family. Um, the, you know, I think we had a strategic level effect on their criminality. I think we cut the percentage of GDP considerably. I think we scared them. And when we say them, I mean the leadership of North Korea all the way up to the level of Kim Jong-il. Uh, but then in 2006, those efforts were abandoned by the Bush administration. And we've seen, based on what I've heard from defectors and from government colleagues, a slow recovery and the illicit ac activities of the North Korean regime. 
Um, we've seen an even more uh, protracted increase in the weapons of mass destruction proliferation activity, I believe, behind the scenes. Um, these are not always in the same pots, but they ultimately everyone has to kick up revolutionary funds to Kim Jong-il, and uh, 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 almost exclusively the source of those funds is going to be some type of illicit conduct. Conventional trade is just not very profitable for North Korea. Thank you very much. My time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We go to uh, Mr. Brad Sherman, Ranking Member on the Terrorism, Nonproliferation and Trade Subcommittee. Uh, thank you. Um, I usually agree with my colleague from American Samoa, but I do want to address briefly his view that there's uh, hypocrisy in America's nonproliferation policy. Uh, the world has avoided the destruction that many predicted when uh, the nuclear genie was unleashed in 1945, chiefly because of the Nonproliferation Treaty. Uh, Iran and North Korea are in violation of that treaty. The five permanent nations of the, uh, uh, on the uh, Security Council are in full compliance because they signed as nuclear states. And India, Pakistan, and Israel are non-signatories. Defending that treaty is critical since uh, without it, uh, I'm sure that there would be dozens of, of nuclear states and we would have experienced several nuclear wars uh, by now. Uh, I would also point out that Iran has no legitimate uh, fears, uh, uh, no even illegitimate fears of Israel. They do not share a border. Israel has not called for a world without a Persia. Um, it, uh, Iran's nuclear program is not defensive. Um, in fact, um, uh, there are striking similarities between Iran and North Korea, but one striking difference is the degree of ambition. You've described a regime in uh, North Korea that seems to be, in, and their number one goal seems to be make sure that fine scotch is available uh, to, the, uh, to the elite. Um, Iran uh, has sought to influence affairs uh, around the world uh, bombed the Jewish Community Center in Buenos Aires, which I believe is as far as you can get from Iran without going into outer space. So um, uh, Iran, both by action and, I, and, and rhetoric, is intent on um, uh, accomplishing, uh, on, 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 on affecting things far outside uh, its borders in ways that we would find uh, unacceptable. Um, going to ask uh, our witnesses uh, a question I'll kind of preview for a second, and that is just in terms of billions of dollars, I would want to break down North Korea's uh, sources of foreign capital uh, or funds into the following categories. Their military and nuclear exports, their, uh, their illicit uh, but uh, non-lethal exports, their licit activities, and in that I would include uh, goods that are licit uh, except for the fact that they're mislabeled and sold as made in some other country but actually made in North Korea or the Kaesong uh, um, uh, economic zone. Uh, the subsidies uh, they receive from China, including the reduced price on oil, and then finally aid, which I realize is not completely under the control of the North Korean government. But before I ask for that question, uh, I would say that uh, it's going to be very hard to uh, force this regime to change its behavior um, in return for, because, uh, and to give up its nuclear weapons because, among other things, that's what Gaddafi did. He, um, the sins of Gaddafi's past came, visited him notwithstanding his promise uh, and, uh, you know, his change in behavior. He did not have nuclear weapons and uh, um, he's no longer with us. Uh, that's a good thing except to the extent that it shows the North Koreans um, that mir uh, what can happen. Uh, with that, why don't I hear from the witnesses, can you try to tell me roughly in terms of billions of dollars how, uh, how that money shakes down? Does anybody have an answer? Dr. Lee? As you know, it's very hard Obviously. to pin down numbers. Uh, there have been reports over the years that North Korea makes several hundreds of millions of dollars in the sales of weapons. Uh, so missiles. less than a billion, but hundreds of millions. Less than a billion. 
But no, the North Korean economy is very small. In terms of uh, per capita GDP, it's one of the lowest in the world. Uh, the only country in the Asia Pacific that has uh, a smaller economy uh, in terms of per capita GDP is Burma. Yeah. And North Korea's economy uh, compares unfavorably with many countries of Africa. It's a $40 billion economy. Uh, when North Korea was exporting, say, around the year 2000, only about half a billion dollars worth of goods, uh, and this is soon after uh, the famine years, South Korea gave North Korea unconditionally uh, cash and other blandishments, including food, fertilizer, uh, worth hundreds of millions of dollars per year. And over the course of 10 years, during the so-called sunshine policy year, South Korea gave North Korea unconditionally uh, over $10 billion in aid. Now, I don't want to say that was uh, a necessary condition to uh, prolonging the regime, to preserving the North Korean regime, um, but it was a factor. That kind of unconditional, non-discriminating aid, I don't think is uh, in the best interest of the international community. Uh, South Korea still has a major joint economic venture with North Korea, as you mentioned, the Kaesong Industrial Complex. The total sum that North Korea makes from that enterprise is perhaps about $20 million or so a year. Not a huge sum, um, but uh, as you raise, uh, there are questions of Kaesong produced goods, North Korean made goods uh, that are sold um, outside the Korean Peninsula. And, and, and how much do they get from China? Well, probably over a billion dollars worth of goods per year, which is uh, a drop in the bucket for the Chinese economy. If I may, uh, Chairman, the, the, the missile side of the ledger, North Korea has had made significant money from selling missiles. And when they have these nuclear, when they have missile launchers, it's a, it's a marketing approach to telling everyone these things work and so forth. But with the uh, proliferation security initiative and things tightening up, uh, the markets are not there for North Korea. So they're hurting when it, with respect to missile sales. Uh, they must have made quite a bit of money with the al uh program uh, that was selling a missile nuclear technology in al a five megawatt reactor similar to Yongbyon. So there's a bit of pressure or more than a bit of pressure on North Korea with respect to foreign reserves and, 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 and getting the capital necessary to sustain that element of uh, lifestyle for the elite in, in Pyongyang. So, uh, and I think on the China side, I think things are tightening up on China. I don't think China is, the largesse is not there. I think China is looking at things very closely. So I think the Kim Jong-un government is looking at some significant financial problems. One very quick point. North Korea has been uh, aggressively exporting mo uh, monetary, non-monetary gold. And uh, if you're trying to tighten up the financial effect against North Korea, you need to look at these tradable uh, precious metals as a sanctioned item. Uh, they can be, uh, they are typically marked with a North Korean emblem. And when they're not, the gold can be essayed precisely as to where its origin uh, emanates from. So you could create a verification compliance regime that could screen out the gold exports, which might be generating as much as a billion uh, plus a year for North Korea. Um, our estimate in 2005 of North Korea's illicit earnings writ large was between 800 and a billion dollars, um, and that was overtly illegal acts. I do think that that's declined considerably. However, I think it's increasing. Thank you for the idea, Dr. Asher. It's a good one. Uh, we'll go to Mr. Marino. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen, and thank you for being here, over here. <laughs> uh, first of all, let me say that uh, I personally do not consider a retired basketball player showing up at his own PR promotion in a wedding dress a serious, credible ambassador representing the United States. And secondly, as far as the terrorist state of Iran is concerned, the U.S., to be sure, will continue to stand shoulder to shoulder with our Israeli friends and do whatever we have to do to protect Israel and the world from the fanatics who control Iran. Now my question is, and looking at this from a six degree of separation perspective, and I know you've been asked what can we specifically do, uh, I'm going to ask basically the same question again, but, but from a different angle. Uh, can each of you address what countries and businesses within those countries 
do business directly or indirectly with North Korea, knowing, and obviously, that China is at the top of that list, and we do a great deal of business with China, and they, have most, they hold most of our outside debt. Uh, it's complex. I know there's no single answer, but can you elaborate more on the specifics about what we do with those individuals, those other countries and businesses? And just start, Ambassador, and just down the line. If I may, uh, China, as you said, sir, is, is key. I think, I mean, literally, with, the, with respect to trade and investment, it's, it's China. Uh, the European Union in the past had considerable uh, interaction with North Korea. I think that's diminished significantly, given North Korea's, North Korea's bad behavior. So my, my simple answer is China. And, and without China, uh, in my view, the North Korean uh, economy just crumbles. Right. Agreed. Dr. Lee. Uh, we do know of specific North Korean institutions that engage in proliferation and other illicit activities. There's a long list. Uh, Executive Order 13382 mentions 30 or so North Korean uh, entities, uh, including individuals. And the most recent UN Security Council Resolution 2087, adopted in January, lists four North Korean individuals by name, Park Chang-ho, Chang Myung-jin, uh, Na kyung soo and Kim Gwang-il. A couple of those are associated with North Korea's so-called space program, science and technology. The other two are associated with a North Korean company, Dancheon Commercial Bank, which is a long history of engaging in uh, illicit activities. There is also, in the UN Security Council Resolution 2087, uh, a freeze on the assets owned by uh, a North Korean bank, uh, Dongbang Uneng, Dongbang Bank, uh, Eastern Land Bank. So the problem is not necessarily identifying sufficient number of targets, but implementing those targets. Uh, Dr. Asher, I'm going to expand this a little bit. Let's talk about the realities. What ramifications will the United States face in taking action against countries and businesses that are doing business or promoting North Korea, whether that's through China or some other entity? What are we looking at? Well, I mean, it was, let's, the, the, objectively, it was only when we designated Banco Delta Asia in September 2005 that the Chinese finally began to act against both proliferation and illicit activity. They acted quite decisively. They sprang to life as a partner of ours for about a year, and then once we uh, re remedied that action, it ended. I saw absolutely no blowback effects against the broader relationship with China, of that designation of that bank. Uh, in fact, uh, the Chinese were extremely scared that we were going to designate other banks where we made them aware that we had observed the exact same activities except at a larger scale. Um, they acted in a very businesslike fashion, like the professor suggested. They, their pragmatism uh, reigned supreme. They didn't threaten to sell off their treasury bond holdings or anything extreme, which I think would be self-defeating, actually. Uh, and we got a responsible uh, response from the Chinese government. Uh, I believe that if we were to reimpose certain measures in a clear and consistent and transparent fashion uh, of uh, holding uh, Chinese entities and other foreign trading entities responsible for their complicit activities uh, or cooperative activities with North Koreans, uh, they would shun their North Korean partners. Thank you, and I yield back my nine seconds. Thank you. We go to Lois Frankel. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, panel, for your discussion today. Uh, I know we, we've heard some, you know, it's quite horrifying to, to hear uh, uh, so many of the things you're talking about, you know, right, human right violations, uh, illicit activities of the counterfeiting of money, cigarettes, drugs, but the, the increase in nuclear capacity uh, is disturbing, uh, assisting Iran in its procurement of a nuclear weapon. Um, my question to each of you is, though, wh what's the end game? What do we, in the end, do we want to accomplish? What, what, I mean, North Korea has 21 million people. It's in a, a strategic location. If we could cure these ills, wh what is it that we're, that, what's the end game that we're looking for? 
our policy is a complete, verified, irreversible disarmament of the North Korean nuclear program, but I think that's become, unfortunately, sort of a fanta fantasy. Um, we all wish that could be the case. Um, I believe that we need to take a, a range of measures to try to actively undermine the North Korean nuclear program, uh, measures which I'm not going to talk about in any detail, but we, one can guess what those are. It begins with an aggressive counterproliferation, counter network operations initiative equivalent to what we had against the AQCon network. It would extend into any sort of special measures which could be taken to try to interfere with the integrity of North Korea's facilities as they threaten to be engaged in producing proliferation uh, grade material. Uh, and we're going to have to look at North Korean embassies and offices around the world and whether they should be allowed to have diplomatic sovereignty if they're engaged in commercial conduct, most uh, uh, specifically the sale of weapons of mass destruction, which is not something which is necessarily uh, allowed under the Geneva Conventions uh, governing diplomatic conduct. The ultimate end game, in my view, is to encourage, take action to facilitate the emergence of a single free Korean state. And this is a long-term project, obviously. Uh, this year, again, marks the 60th anniversary of the Korean War. And I think the best way to honor those brave souls who answered the call to defend a country they never knew, a people they never met, as it is eloquently inscribed at the plaque in the Korean War Veterans Memorial, is for pragmatic and prudent policymakers in Washington and Seoul to come together to lay the foundation for a genuine, a permanent peace in the Korean Peninsula and to deliver the long-suffering North Korean people from bondage. I think the first step is to come back to the September 2005 joint statement. We had Kim Jong-il commit to it. We had Kim Jong-il in Beijing committing to comprehensive denuclearization. Kim Jong-un has never said he is permitted, he's prepared to denuclearize or he's committed to the September 2000. Kim Jong-un needs to commit to that joint statement as his father did and commit to denuclearization. A nuclear North Korea, given all the reasons we discussed this morning with the potential for proliferation, is just, and, and what it means to the NPT, the whole regime, the nuclear proliferation regime, and the nuclear arms race that would engender if they, if they retain those weapons. It's just not, it's not, it, it's, it's not tolerable. It, it, and and that should be, and one would hope that's where the DPRK is, that's the ultimate. But for that, they need security assurances, economic assistance. Ultimately, with, when they get their act together on illicit activities, they could become a normal state. And then the two Koreas, the unification issue, because this is one Korea, this is the Korean Peninsula, and so forth. But I think the first step has to be coming back to something they committed to in 2005. And they've conveniently walked away from it, saying now they are a nuclear weapon state, and we're talking about, if you will, uh, disarmament issues. Well, it's not non-proliferation of disarmament, it's denuclearization. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you. We go now to Mr. Weber. Randy? I don't remember which one of you it was uh, that suggested, maybe it was you, Dr. Lee, that we give uh, the Treasury investigative authority. What, what, can you restate, uh, make that argument again? I want to follow that through and then I have a question for you. Uh, I think the United States should pass a bill that allows for the expansion of designation of prohibitive, uh, prohibited activity, that is uh, additional actions that would come under this new bill as uh, prohibited, uh, including actions further furthering North Korea's proliferation, illicit activities, import of luxury goods, cash transactions, bulk cash smuggling, basically. Uh, sales of lethal military equipment, small arms as well, uh, and also actions that further perpetrate the continuation of crimes against humanity. Uh, also, I would urge Congress to pass a new bill that gives Treasury investigative powers, that requires the Treasury Department to investigate suspicious actions, reports of sus suspicious activity. Uh, 
But let me, th that's the question I have. So, but that's on the monetary part of it. That's not in, in uh, human, any kind of violations of human rights. Is that, is that right? Well, any activity that is linked to violations of human rights, I would call for that as well. But the focus, yes, is on monetary illicit activity. Through the Treasury, but aren't those types of activities that you outlined already a part of what we watch pretty closely? Yes, but making it a law, uh, bounding, requiring the Treasury Department to actually take action I think would make a difference. Okay, uh, that's my only question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, um, we go now to Congresswoman Gabbard. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you to our panel here uh, for being here today. I represent uh, the second congressional district in Hawaii, which uh, as we've seen through the last couple of launches, uh, experts have testified that Hawaii along with some of our northwestern states uh, are within range, within missile range of North Korea. So this is a, an issue that's very real for us, not only as a state, but also because of our uh, military presence there and strategic location uh, within our national defense. Uh, I'm wondering your view on what the current estimate is realistically of when North Korea may have a warhead missile combination that could strike uh, the United States, as well as uh, your assessment of our missile defense and what we can do to prevent this from occurring or at least slowing down their progress? Well, I, I, I believe they're quite a ways from having that capability, Congresswoman. I, I, we're talking about miniaturization, miniaturizing that, that nuclear weapon and mating it to a delivery system and having that delivery system be successful in reentry, bringing, uh, bringing that warhead into uh, target area. I think they're quite a distance from that. They're working towards it. I think the, uh, this, this launch in, in December uh, was significant, uh, it putting a satellite in orbit. I think this uh, nuclear test was significant. It was uh, quite a bit larger, much more, uh, sig more significant than the one uh, uh, previous to that in 2009. So they are making progress, but I believe they're quite a ways. The testing has to be done, they have to, the mating is very difficult, so the science is there. It doesn't mean they're not seeking that, obviously they seem, they are seeking that, but uh, I think the, uh, the uh, distance is, uh, is quite a ways. I think on missile defense, I think with our capabilities, I think they're very robust. We're not talking about a significant arsenal, we're talking about four to six weapons, we're saying, and if they, given the uh, uranium enrichment program, we could, uh, we could add additional weapons to that, so we're talking about a, a finite number of potential nuclear weapons that could be delivered, again, way down the road, I think we would be well prepared. Thank you. I reply to Congresswoman uh, Frankel's question thus, the end game for the United States and for South Korea should be to seek the emergence of a united, free, open, democratic Korea with its official seat of government in Seoul. North Korea's end game is also unification under its own initiative. That is the ongoing North Korean revolution, and it is stated explicitly. Now, as hard for us as that may be to conceive, to imagine North Korea suffers uh, against South Korea, lags behind in every index of measuring state power except for military power. Uh, that is the ultimate objective of the North Korean state. And one key stepping stone in achieving that eventual unification, communization, is to evict the U.S. troops from South Korea. And this is tied to North Korea's nuclear and long-range missile programs. That is, if North Korea were to able to demonstrate that it has uh, achieved that capability to marry a nuclear warhead to an intercontinental ballistic missile, uh, North Korea's bargaining power would be enhanced tremendously. And in my view, the ultimate goal of the North Korean regime by systematically pursuing such weapons development program is not necessarily to attack the United States. North Korea is not suicidal. Self-preservation is its ultimate objective. But to be able to negotiate vis-a-vis -vis the United States from a position of strength on a host of matters, political matters, economic matters, and specifically on the matter of the continued presence of US troops in South Korea that has played over the past 60 years the most 
important, the essential role in keeping the peace in the Korean Peninsula. We have had de facto peace in Korea, unstable at times, but it's been the longest period of peace in the Korean Peninsula, in and around the Korean Peninsula since the mid-19th century. And that is thanks to the continued presence of the U.S. troops. And North Korea's objective is to get those troops out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I, I would just, I, I grant your point, Professor Lee, I just interject one point, and that is you do have a habit here, though, to consider as well on the part of the, administra of the government in North Korea, and that's the habit of proliferate, proliferation. And so far they've proliferated every other weapons program they've gotten a handle on, uh, including to Syria. So in this particular instance, uh, you have seismic activity which would indicate that yes, it's a much greater yield in terms of this explosion, and at the same time, it's a smaller warhead. So they must be getting closer in terms of that capability of placing it on that three-stage ICBM that they've already mastered. Um, we, we go now to Mr. Rohrbacher, who is the ranking member on Europe, Eurasia, and emerging threats. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to thank you personally, as well as uh, thank uh, Chairwoman uh, Ileana ross Layton for the strong leadership that both of you have provided uh, on this issue of Korea. Uh, I remember uh, many uh, years ago when I first <laughs> was elected and became a member of this committee, uh, there was the debate as to whether and what policies we should have and uh, these six-party talks and how much uh, and whether we were going to give North Korea aid or not. Uh, can someone fill me in? And we, we see here that South Korea has given North Korea $10 billion in aid. Uh, over the years, the United States has provided food and oil uh, or fuel for North Korea. How much have we provided North Korea in uh, that type of assistance? Do we have a, anyone in the panel have a number on that? Well, I, I could just put out with, with the, uh, on the, f the food, I think the U.S. was the, the, the greatest donor nation on humanitarian food aid for an extended period of time to North Korea. And on the fuel, heavy fuel oil, pursuant to the agreed framework with mm -hmm. the Korea Energy Development Corporation, we provided significant amounts of heavy fuel oil. Well, I know that both of them are significant. Does only have a number for me? Are we talking about billions of dollars worth of food and oil? I would think we're close to that. Please, Professor Lee. Uh, according to the Congressional Research Service, a little over a billion. Um, In food and oil? Yes. Okay, so we have provided uh, over a billion dollars uh, of food and oil for Korea over these last few years. Let me just note that I remember uh, that uh, several members of Congress, me included, uh, were, were very vocally opposed to this policy, uh, suggesting that it would be uh, counterproductive and would be seen as a sign of weakness and actually uh, would not bring about change in North Korea. And in fact, I think we have been proven correct in those uh, uh, aggressive opposition to that policy. Uh, let me just say, when you know, you act like idiots. I mean, idiots are the people who give, uh, do favors for their enemies. And when you act like idiots, you got to be expected to be treated like an idiot by your enemy. And that's what's going on here in Korea. They're, they're, they've been playing us, uh, frankly, uh, uh, ever since that we decided to start giving them money. And the fact that South Korea was willing to give them uh, over $10 billion in aid, and now, uh, we see that this regime is what? Is declaring that the truce is no longer going to be in place? I mean, this is a slap in the face uh, to the useful idiots all over the world that think you can buy off uh, totalitarian enemies by being friends with them. And uh, let me just suggest also, and, and this is to my dear friend, Mr. Felamuega, who I might add is a Vietnam veteran who uh, is a, a heroic individual, but I'm sorry that I think coconuts make good pina coladas, but they make really bad policy. <laughs> and uh, uh, it, it seems to me that uh, what we, uh, and one last thought before I get, my, before I get to my question, and that is, thank God we have missile defense. Over the years, to the same time we're fighting, 
to make sure we don't give our enemies money, which they now have used to develop nuclear weapons. At the very least, we fought through a missile defense system, which may provide us some security in the United States against missiles launched from North Korea to Southern California. So thank God that we overrode those, uh, uh, that opposition to missile defense, which was very strong in this Congress. And finally, I'd just like to talk, ask about China. Uh, you, you folks, Dr. Lee, you, you tended not to, it's sort of to poo-poo this, but, and I've, I agree with you, regime change and uh, uh, one singular Korea has to be the goal. Uh, but isn't China really pulling a lot of strings up there in North Korea? And, and aren't they the ones who uh, uh, hold the, the, the key to changing the direction in North Korea? Let the peaceful change of direction. Uh, in, indeed, the Chinese, again, won't take any kind of initiative to destabilize the DPRK and sees the continued existence of North Korea to be in their national interest. Having that North Korea card to play vis-a-vis -vis the United States over the long term uh, and having that buffer zone, uh, China sees that to be in its interest. But all so, so vectors... So let me note right here. So you assume, you would have us assume, that when we hear things like, we're gonna, there's going to be no more truce and we're doing these that the Chinese are actually uh, in agreement with the North Koreans on that type of hostile act. Uh, the Chinese are not very pleased with North Korea because North Korea has always defied uh, China, even being such a beneficiary of Chinese largesse. North Korea has never caved into Chinese pressure throughout the past 60 years or so. The Chinese have reasons to be uh, a bit displeased uh, toward Pyongyang. But all vectors of national interest do not go on the same trajectory forever. Uh, they can diverge. And uh, if we come to a situation where by the Chinese leadership has to make a decision to wave goodbye to the DPRK or to take a major risk in confronting the United States and other powers in the region, uh, I think pragmatism would prevail. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Rohrbacher. We now go to Grace May. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member. And thank you to our witnesses for being here today. Uh, my question is to any or each of you. Uh, former South Korean President Lee Myung-bak made many aspects of his overall approach to North Korea contingent upon progress towards uh, denuclearizing North Korea. How can the new President Park link North-South Korean cooperation to progress on reducing uh, nuclear and missile threats? Alternatively, uh, what is your evaluation of Kim John Un's first year in power, and do you see any of his policies as deviating from his father's or towards any type of uh, reform? Okay. I'll say very briefly, I think that he's on a course of uh, much more aggressive action than his uh, father, uh, largely because he's in a position of relative weakness. As a 28-year-old, he's not the eldest son, uh, uh, and um, he's in a position also where his revolutionary state requires a lot of resources and as we've heard they're economically in increased trouble and they're unwilling to go through some sort of conventional economic reform even though he's announced that as a priority they just haven't demonstrated any serious intent to do this so that leaves them in a situation where they're sort of riding a, a nuclear tiger and once you're on that tiger it's hard to get off so I'm concerned that his next step uh, steps in the, in the next year are going to be more provocative than we've even seen up to now Perhaps after that, we'll have a diplomatic opportunity. But along the way, it could get quite rough. In my view, one common misperception about North Korean behavior is that the regime merely reacts to external stimuli, that the regime reacts in a negative way to sanctions or UN Security Council resolutions and so forth. Uh, North Korea has been, I would argue strongly, the far more proactive party in dealing with the U.S. and South Korea uh, throughout the entire history of the Cold War to this present day. North Korea will strategically provoke in a controlled, limited way, occasionally launching deadly attacks against South Korea and the United States, but in a controlled, limited way, because again, North Korea is not suicidal. So this pattern of provocations will continue, whether we are nice to North Korea or we are firm on principles vis-a-vis uh, -vis Pyongyang. If we were to tighten, on, tighten down um, sanctions, put more pressure on the regime, uh, it's quite plausible, perhaps even likely, that North Korea will react in a negative way. 
perhaps even launch a limited attack uh, on the West Sea uh, or elsewhere in and around the Korean Peninsula. But such provocations are a part of North Korea's long-term strategy. They will happen regardless of how generous we are. Uh, we had two naval skirmishes uh, during the Sunshine Policy years, uh, despite South Korea's very generous engagement policy toward North Korea in the mid-2000s. We had a, uh, a missile test.